Hey, it's Mr. Klein here and welcome to part two of my six part series on hurricanes to strike the coastline in Louisiana. So in the last episode, we looked at the 13 to 17 hurricanes, uh, depending on the primary sources found, that made landfall from the beginning of European settlement to the Ile Dernier or last island hurricane of 1856. So in this episode, we're going to look at the hurricanes to strike Louisiana in the back half of the 19th century. So let's get going with that. So in 1860, storm clouds were forming politically in the state in the lead up to the Civil War. And the year was also a hat trick of hurricane strikes for the state as well. So the first was in August when a category three major hurricane hit just east of the site of the last island hurricane. A month later, a strong category two storm struck the Mississippi Mississippi Delta directly, finishing off a lighthouse and destroying the town of Belize. Finally, two weeks after that, a third hurricane, another strong Category 2 storm, struck the Gulf Coast between Morgan City and Franklin. Now, the hurricane itself was actually moving quickly, but there was enough wind and rain to cause nearly 11 miles of railroad southeast New Orleans to be washed away by the storm surge. Apart from a tropical storm that briefly delayed troop movements during the autumn of 1863, the Civil War in Louisiana was unaffected by hurricanes. Six months after the war's end, however, a hurricane struck the extreme southwest coast of the state near Johnson's Bayou. Two years later, a hurricane grazed the state, only passing over the Birdfoot Delta region. The storm left the lighthouse near Shell Beach permanently tilted and dropped enough rain to submerge New Orleans for a fifth time. After nearly a decade of weak tropical storms and hurricane near misses, including a major hurricane that struck Texas in 1875, Louisiana finally ran out of luck in 18. So in late August, a hurricane made landfall just west of the Texas-Louisiana border, but sent a 10-foot storm surge into Cameron Parish. The Acadiana region was heavily damaged with church steeples falling in Lafayette and Broussard. Schoolhouses moved off their foundations in Broussard, New Iberia, and Morgan City. And the entire sugar crop in St. Mary Parish was lost. Less than two weeks later, a major hurricane made landfall just southwest of Morgan City, which was almost flattened by the storm. And throughout most of the state, there were disastrous agricultural losses. So in the decade after the 1875 hurricanes, Louisiana again dodged several near misses by tropical storms and hurricane strikes on both Texas and Mississippi. In 1886, the state was hit by two hurricanes in the same area. So in June, a slow-moving Category 1 storm made landfall right at the Texas-Louisiana border, flooding that part of the state as far north as Alexandria, which received over 21 inches of rain during the storm. In October of that year, a Category 3 storm made landfall in almost the exact same spot, putting Cameron Parish completely underwater again, with thousands of cattle drowned and survivors left clinging to debris until the waters receded. So the years 1887 to 1887, 1889 saw a hurricane strike the state each year, with 1888 being particularly devastating. So the hurricane made landfall as a borderline Category 3 at the now abandoned last island before charging inland, with Terrebonne and Lafouche Parish's hardest hit. So New Orleans set a single day record of just under 9 inches of rain, putting the city completely underwater for the 5th, 6th time. It was bad enough that records show that the 1888 hurricane was actually also the first one in Louisiana with widespread power outages as the early electrical grid greatly damaged by the storm across the entire northern Gulf Coast. 1893 was a terrible year for here in southeast Louisiana. A Category 1 hurricane had already made landfall in Terrebonne Parish, wiped out the town of Lockport, and flooded Franklin to the west with 15 inches of rain. However, nothing prepared the state for what was to occur a month later between Last Island and Grand Isle. And in a community called Chenier Kamananda. Chenier Kamananda was a community on a peninsula of the mainland between the remains of Last Island and Grand Isle. It had a population of around 1,500 people and the town was centered on the fishing industry, which provided seafood for restaurants in New Orleans. The hurricane formed in the Western Caribbean Sea, tracked over the Yucatan Peninsula as a Category 2 storm before entering the Gulf. Now, like the Last Island hurricane, it made landfall at peak strength of 135 miles per hour winds. The residents knew something was amiss when the normal pattern of seabirds changed and cattle started heading inland. The wind picked up as the afternoon progressed and by that evening conditions were ferocious with winds and driving rain. In the middle of the night, the nightmare scenario for anyone who's ever ridden out of hurricane occurred. When the 15 foot storm surge came rushing in, houses and people were swept away and by three the next morning the carnage was over. In total, over 700 residents were killed in the storm and Chenier Kamananda ceased to exist as a functioning community. 
community. The next day, the residents and survivors attempted to bury bodies, but stopped about halfway through because the exertions were so physically exhausting after riding out the storm. News of the disaster reached New Orleans and a massive rescue and recovery effort took place as the entire state attempted to assist in the recovery. Similar scenes were witnessed across the past at Grand Isle where the death toll was smaller due to it just being a vacation community like it is today, as well as further to the east in Plaquemines Parish, where the storm surge was close to 20 feet in spots. The government quarantine station was smashed. Former Louisiana Governor Henry C. Warmoth's plantation Magnolia was wrecked, and nearly 20 ships around the mouth of the Mississippi River were either confirmed sunk or never seen again. By the time the storm dissipated off the coast of North Carolina later that week, around 2,000 people in total were killed, making the hurricane one of the deadliest in American history. So apart from a near miss by a hurricane in 1897, the Chenier Common Fernanda hurricane was the last to strike Louisiana in the 19th century. So in our next episode, we will look at the first 65 years of the 20th century and revisit the hurricane strikes that occurred then. We'll see the growth of meteorology as a science, the busiest decade of storms in the century in the Atlantic Basin, a tropical storm so disastrous it'll get a mention, and the advent of modern technology in hurricanes as well. Oh, and New Orleans will get flooded a couple times more as well. So there you go. I hope Hey guys, future Mr. Klein here. I wanted to mention a couple extra things about the Chenier coming out of Hurricane that I didn't know about when I was recording those scenes at first. So the first is that Chenier Caminata and Grand Isle provided inspiration for the settings of stories by famed American author Cape Chopin. Of course, she's known for her novel The Awakening and other short stories. They're seen as the beginning of early modern feminist themes in American literature. In fact, there's even literary analyses of The Awakening that make the connection between the impact of the hurricane that struck in 1893, as well as the actions of Edna, the main character of the story. The other thing I wanted to mention was that while I was down there, I didn't get to record any footage at this location, but there is a cemetery on the side of Louisiana Highway 1 in the area of where Chenier Caminata was that contains two memorial signs for the storm that were put up on there for the centenary, which was 1993. Because I didn't go there, I'm not sure if the cemetery contains any graves that date back to before the hurricane, so they survived, or it contains anyone who died in the storm and was buried there, so I'm not sure about any of that. But if there's any locals or people familiar with the area who know one way or the other, please let me know in the comments below. And with that, we are now finally complete with part two in our series. As always, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments below, and thanks for watching.